Hello, beautiful humans. Welcome back to another episode of The Robin Graham Show. I have a question for you today. Have you ever thought about the legacy that you will leave? A tough question, right? I know a lot of people haven't thought about that, and it really wasn't until recently that I started thinking about it more in depth and more in detail. And one of the things that really made me think about it was when I published my book. You don't have to be an author to leave a legacy. Every single one of us has a history, a journey, our experiences, how we've impacted the world, and all of those things are part of our legacy. But we're going to learn more about how we can consider our legacy and how we can start thinking about the legacy that we want to leave, to leave to leave it in a way that, I guess, uh, for a lack of a better phrase, are our the people we're leaving behind can be really proud of us. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure exactly how to say that because I don't want to sound morbid, like, oh, we're all going to die. But eventually, of course, that will happen. Um, but we're also going to talk about, as we talk about leaving a legacy, we're also going to talk about journaling. And you all know that that's something that is, of course, near and dear to my heart. I published a journal when I published You, Me, and Anxiety this year. And we're going to give you some top tips for journaling so that as you start to think about your legacy, maybe you can consider journaling as well. But my guest today is an expert in both. And we're going to dive into some uh, history to start with. And I'm going to leave you hanging there for a second so you don't even know what kind of history until she starts talking. But we're going to talk about a little bit of our history first and then legacy and then journaling tips. So without further ado, Meryl Saverstein, welcome to The Robin Graham Show. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. I'm looking well, very I have been... To... Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, I just said I'm looking very forward to our conversation. Yes. So am I. I... Okay, before I start, because I could just go on and on, I'm really, really excited to have this conversation with you. So before I babble on any further, I would love for you to tell the listeners just a little bit about you and how you got into this work of helping other people document their legacy or leave the legacy that they want to leave and identify that legacy. And then we'll talk a little bit more about how you got into the journaling component as well. Um, originally I was an educator, so I, I have always been a teacher. I started in elementary school and directed a day camp. I um, was the director of a preschool and eventually I started really trying to figure out what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. And I ended up, and it's a very long story, which I won't share today, but I ended up meeting a man on the beach who eventually became the director of the Anne Frank Center in New York City. And his job was to bring a photographic exhibition of Anne Frank all over the all over the country. And because I had quit my job, he asked me if I would like to do that. And so I brought the exhibit to Miami. It was called Anne Frank in the World, 1929 to 1945 to Miami in 1985. And I did a lot of student programming around the exhibition. And as a result of that, I had two women from the Holocaust Documentation and Education Center in Miami come and speak to the students. After that, they contacted me and asked me if I would come and help them as a volunteer um, and institute some kind of student programming. So I did because I wasn't working. And the secretary at the center quit. They asked me if I would be the secretary. And I said I would for three months. But if if after three months I, I was not in the education department, I was out of there. And they had hired someone with her doctorate um, to lead the department. Unfortunately, she, unfortunately for her, but fortunately for me, she did not work out. And so I became the director of educational outreach at this Holocaust Center. My job was to help the survivors, pass, Holocaust survivors, to pass along their legacy of remembrance to students and teachers. And so in the 26 years that I was the director of educational outreach, what I did was I planned programs, anywhere from 10 to 12 programs for high school and college students with a Holocaust survivor sitting at a table with 10 students. And these students had the opportunity to see a video, which was it was a, a movie really um, of letters and diaries from children who had been in the Holocaust with pictures mm -hmm. of, of surrounding the Holocaust. And then someone from the podium would speak about 
the concentration camps because that was something that all students wanted to hear. It was not the experience. While some people think every Holocaust survivor was in a concentration camp, that was really not the experience. Uh -huh. But we wanted them to have that opportunity. And then we would let the students ask any questions that they wanted of the survivors. And so the survivors would share their stories. They would talk about how they were once teenagers, just like the, the students are, and their, their hopes and dreams were shattered all because of prejudice. And then we would switch the focus and say to them, okay, so their lives were changed because of prejudice. What kinds of prejudice are you experiencing in your life? And these were, you know, these were, high school students not sitting with classmates. We always separated them, uh, but they would talk about what they were dealing with. And Miami is a multicultural community. So it was all kinds of students from all over the world really sitting at a table together. So that was what I did. We also did teacher institutes and the teacher institutes once a year were such that we had a survivor sitting with the teachers. Every single day, the teacher sat with a different survivor and got had really had the privilege of having the conversation with them as well. So by the end of the week, they had talked to five different survivors on a personal level. And I always did a journaling workshop for the teachers because I felt it was important for them to be able to journal as they taught and also for them to help their students journal because this is information that's really difficult to, uh, to process. Mm -hmm. So, after 26 years, I decided it was time for me to retire. I knew I wasn't finished with my education, um, teaching, doing whatever, but I also thought I felt I really wanted to write a book. And that led me to a year before I retired of looking at my life and trying to figure out what it was that I wanted to do. And one of the things that was really interesting is I posed about 25 questions to myself just looking at the whole thing. How am I going to supplement my income? What, what speaks to my soul? Who will I be when I'm no longer the director of educational outreach? I mean, all of those questions that I really, I, I spent a year journaling about. And at the time I walked out in December of 2019, I knew exactly how I was going to live the rest of my life. I knew what the next chapter was. And so my goal was to write a book, to teach, to speak, and to volunteer. And the only issue was I didn't know what to teach. And so that became a problem for me. I mean, I knew that I wanted to teach. I did not want to go back into the classroom, but I really wasn't sure. And one day when I was journaling, the word legacy came down on paper. And I said, you know, I wonder if there's something to that. I wonder if there would be an interest in people thinking about their legacy. And in fact, because I had done so much with Holocaust survivors and their legacy, it just was something that I knew was really significant. And so I developed a course called Living and Leaving Your Legacy. I, um, After I wrote the book, I began speaking about the book. And then once I started teaching, I started teaching classes. So in September of 2012, I taught my first legacy class. Um, that class was eight weeks. I have now taught 65 classes of an average of six weeks a class. So I've been busy teaching and also speaking. I'm doing a lot of speaking about legacy. And um, and that's that's basically the history. So I, I just think it's so beautiful. And you've got such a beautiful way about you. I can only imagine yeah. how you have inspired other people. To, to look at their lives and discover what their legacy is and then to document it. I, you know, I look back and I'm, I've always been kind of an old soul. I've always loved history and I've always loved being around older people. And I've always loved talking about their stories. And it makes me really sad because my, my father passed away 18 years ago. And then my grandma, grandmother passed away in 2020, um, from COVID mm -hmm. and my uncle passed away at the same time. And we don't have anyone to ask those questions of anymore. And there's one thing you suggested in your, in your book about, if you don't journal, at least get one of those books where you can have the grandparent write things down. And I did that for my parents. So I have a lot of um, 
cool trivia type things that I can share with my kids, you know, stories from my father and my mother's still alive. So we can still ask her anything, but I think it's really important to, to recognize the fact that we don't always take the time to ask those questions of our ancestors or, you know, our grandparents, our parents, and in a fleeting moment, they can be gone and no longer with us. And then we can't ask those questions. So that's one of the reasons why I just love the whole concept of the work you're doing to help people identify for themselves what they want to leave and how they want to be remembered and what lessons they want to teach the people beneath them who are following behind them and their families, or even just in the general population. So I love this so much. I think it's there's just such a powerful nature to it, I think. And especially if you've been a person who has lived by your values and done good work in the world, why would you not want to leave that for your the generations that come behind you to, to follow suit and, and to have that as an inspiration? So I'd just like to talk a little bit about some of the things that you said. Yeah. One of the things, when I started developing the course, I, I chose the title Living and Leaving Your Legacy because I realized that how we live our lives becomes our legacy. And so if, in fact, one never does anything, if if one never leaves a book, writes uh makes a scrapbook, does a collage for someone, writes a legacy love letter, writes an ethical well, does none of that. We're going to remember people the way they live their life. Mm -hmm. And so it's really important to understand that it's really not what we say, but what we do. Mm -hmm. People are watching us and learning from us all the time. And I will never forget, I had a friend, I, I, um, volunteer with women who have been impacted with cancer. And I had a woman that I was visiting and she was dying. And I said to her, how, Maria, how do you want me to remember you? And she looked at me and she thought for a minute. And she said, you know, Merle, it doesn't matter how I want you to remember me. You're going to remember me the way you want to remember me. You're going to remember me for who I was in your life. And that was really an important, um, a really important lesson for me to learn. The other thing is we all want to know we matter. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that's that's universal across the board. So when I first started teaching the eight week classes, I would do four weeks of living your legacy and four weeks of leaving your legacy, realizing that it was just important. But as time has gone on, that's really changed for me. And now I do six weeks of living your legacy and two weeks of leaving your legacy because I realized that how we live is is going is really the legacy. So even if you don't have the opportunity to ask people the questions or do whatever, I think it's just really important to, for example, when someone dies, to immediately write down as many memories as you can think of so you have those memories. To maybe even write a, a letter, something saying uh, all the things that you wish you had said. Which is not to say that I don't encourage people to ask the questions, to do the interviews, get the information, because there's nothing more valuable than having, for example, a an interview of a person on tape. I was visiting a, a, a couple. This woman was dying of cancer, and I was asked to come to her, her bedside and help her do some legacy work for her 19-year-old son. And she wanted to do a video and she was waiting for the hospice organization to send the video camera, you know, the, the uh, videographer. Mm -hmm. And no one was coming. Her son, husband was sitting with um, an iPad on his lap. And I said, George, you don't have to wait. I said, you can start right now. And so I left. He told me two days later that he videotaped her for four hours. The next morning she woke she did not wake up. She was in a coma and died that day. And so I say, do it now. People, people always say to me, for example, with journaling, people say, you know, you're so lucky you have 48 years of your life documented. I wish I had done that. And I say, start now. Mm -hmm. It's never too late. So, it, you know, I just think we need to be conscious of that. And my goal is to help people live the very best life they can so that they have a legacy that they can be proud of. Mm, that's so beautiful. Mm -hmm. You know, you said so many things there and people learn by example. And so when we live 
in a positive, as a positive example, we can easily leave that legacy, right? Even by the people right. that we touch that are complete strangers in the grocery store or wherever we are. It And I think it can be so empowering for your loved ones that you're leaving behind when they've seen you act in a certain way or be a certain way or, or give your time, give, you know, generously. And I think there's just so much to that. I, I just, I don't know, my heart's kind of fluttering right now because, you know, the stories of these people passing away and everything. And I remember so much of that. And there's so many questions I still have for so many people that I can't ask those questions anymore. And it, it makes me really sad. However, I love what you said about writing down those memories as soon as you possibly can. And that's one thing that when memories come up, you don't have to just sit and write them all at once because sometimes it's hard, you know, but as they come up, write them down. And it, it's something else you can do is like, I just did this this morning. I drive my daughter a half an hour each way to school. Um, so every morning I'm, you know, I drive her to school and today we were passing this, this truck and it was a tree trimming truck. Well, when we were growing up, my sisters and I, I called my sister because I said, I just have to tell you this memory I just had. And I think it's just so funny, but my dad had from this company, this tree trimming company, he had this big, huge orange oversized hoodie. And my sisters and I loved that. And my sister, Annette wore it all the time. I wore it a little bit, but she wore it all the time. She lived in the sweatshirt. And so when I saw that truck, I thought, how many times have I seen that truck and thought to myself, I need to tell my dad that we know the people that own that company. And then it's, oh, he's not here to tell. But to be able to pick up the phone and tell and say to my sister, hey, I just had this funny memory. Do you remember that big orange hoodie? She's like, oh my gosh, I lived in that thing. You know, so to, to be even be able to take those memories that you have and share them verbally, because it just helps keep them solidified in your mind. It helps your mind to remember them, but then to write them down in a journal is even more priceless because then you can extrapolate the emotions you have around that story. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that, I think it's so valuable to do that. I also think that um, sometimes having a dialogue with someone, for example, if, if you're having a problem with someone and you can't speak to the person right now, you're not ready to writing a dialogue between mm -hmm. you and that person is a great way or writing a letter. And I do those kinds of things in my journal as well. I mean, there, mm -hmm. I think there, I think just journaling in general is such a, such a gift that we give ourselves. Mm -hmm. One thing I want to emphasize too, when we, when we write and especially like you just said something, I think very empowering for people when it comes to relationships and building them and maintaining them is that when, when we write, we change the neural pathways in our brain. So if we can get out any of those negative thoughts or emotions and put them on paper, it's much easier to change them to positive because you can actually see them and then change the way you're thinking about them, which is going to change all of your emotions and feelings, which therefore will change your behaviors and how you react to different situations. So I love that you said that because I think it's very, very empowering. But I also want to say something about that because some people are afraid to write in a journal because they're afraid someone will see it. Maybe they had a bad experience as a kid with a mother reading a diary. I say that if you have something that you're afraid that someone might see, the best, the very best thing to do is maybe not write it in your journal, but write it on, on a piece of paper, get it out because that's, like you said, the most important thing. And then maybe even do a ceremony of tearing it up burning it, you know, doing something to get rid of it. But it just, just being able to express yourself on paper, getting it out is just such an important, valuable thing to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Okay. So let me ask you a few questions. So yeah. what should people consider when they're talking about living and then leaving their legacy? Okay. So, so in the, in the living part is just understanding how many different kinds of legacies there are. So there's a legacy to friend to friend, a teacher to a student. There's a legacy, who you are in your family is another legacy. 
um, who you are in your community. So it can be the community that you live in. It could be your church or synagogue. It could be an organization that you belong to. How active are you? How how much a part of it are you? And that's all our choice. You know, we can choose to be just someone who sits in the background or someone who who takes action. Another one that you had mentioned that is really my very favorite is that the legacy that we have on complete strangers, because a stranger can can honestly change a life. I had a friend who had ALS. I went to visit him 30 years ago before hospice was really uh, what it is today. There was a man in the middle of the day visiting my friend Jules, and I was fascinated because he was a perfect stranger who was a hospice volunteer who was sitting and talking to my friend. Fast forward 10 years later, I knew that I wanted to volunteer. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I saw an ad in the paper, the hospice volunteer. It wasn't until I started teaching the, this legacy class 10 years later and looked at the categories of legacy when I realized that it was that man who was sitting in my friend's living room who really impacted my life in a huge way, made a huge mm -hmm. difference for me. And then there's the legacy, an institutional legacy where, where someone's name is on a building, they don't in your profession, who you are in your profession, and then how you might have changed the culture in some way. Mm -hmm. So those are the different legacies. So in in that's all in the living piece of it. The leaving piece is uh, what you leave behind. So for example, my very favorite and, and the gift I think that we give ourselves as well as give others is an ethical will. And an ethical will is like a letter that's written to one's family, loved ones, whomever one chooses that has life lessons, values and beliefs and hopes and dreams. And to be able to do that, you know, we think that we're doing that for someone else, but the real truth is that doing it for ourselves is huge because it really allows us to look at what matters to us in our life and what it is that we really want to pass along. So that's that's my favorite. If, if someone says, I want to do a legacy project, that's the first thing I suggest. But there's so many different things you can do. And, and really to have someone's uh, video, a video of someone talking, to hear a voice, to, to have the person's um, face and, and voice and looking at them is really wonderful. Another thing is to leave something in your handwriting. Because for whatever reason, there is an emotional connection to one's handwriting. And so I know when I see letters from my mother and father, I, you know, all I have to do is look at them and I have a, a warm feeling in my heart. So those are the kinds of living pieces that, that we might consider doing. Oh my gosh. We are such kindred spirits, Meryl. Like, I love that. <laughs> I love that. I, I still have cards and letters from my grandmothers. And yeah. it's funny because my sisters and I were just recently looking for a letter my father had written. He passed away just before my sister's now husband had proposed to her. But my father, anticipating this was going to happen, wrote him a letter to say that he approved. Wow. And, um, so we were, we were just my sister with a, a couple of us were asking my sister, like, where's that letter? Can we just see it just to see his handwriting? We don't need to see the content, but just to see how he signed it. Um, he, in, in his Bibles, he always wrote notes. And so we have that, those little teeny tiny letters that how he wrote, which was so neat and precise and his hands were gigantic. So, you know, to see how he wrote, like, there's just, I don't know. It, that that always touches my heart too. So I love that suggestion. So let's talk a little bit about um, journaling because uh, as I said before, that's something that's that's very important to me. And when I was reading your book, you you talk about how you really struggled with, okay, I have all of these journals and I think now you have 390 of them. Yeah, and yeah. which my collection pales in comparison. I maybe have, I don't know, 30, but, um, I'm a lot it, older than you are. Robin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot more time. Huh? <laughs> right. Well, it's funny how my journaling in and of itself has, has transformed over the years. I started just with a gratitude journal. And I always say to people, especially people who are struggling with emotional challenges or mental health challenges, start with gratitude because it really helps you 
put into perspective the good things and seeing different obstacles in your life as opportunities versus just things that are going to bring you down and, and hinder your life where there's always something to be grateful for. And that's how I actually started my journaling practice. And now it has transformed to the morning is kind of my like brain dump and, you know, get everything out of my head onto paper, all those emotions. And then in the evening, it's, it's gratitude and a summary of my day. So if my children or my husband ever pick up this journal, they're going to know exactly what I was doing when and how it went and how I felt and, you know, but there are those questions of, oh my gosh, like this is my private thing. And do I share it? So I would love for you to talk about those tips for journaling now that I've said my tips for journaling, but I would love for you to share your tips for journaling for those people, because I've heard so many people say, I don't, I don't, I just am not a good writer. I don't, I don't like to journal. I just, I've tried it and I didn't like it. So I would love for your, you to share your perspective on that, how to start, and then some tips for just continuing. I think one of the most important things is pe some people are intimidated by the blank page. And so for sure, my the only rule in journaling is that there is no rule. I, I suggest that you date your entry. That's a real, for me, that's really important because when you go back to read it, if, if you do, it's wonderful to know when exactly you wrote whatever you wrote. But other than that, there are no rules. And the way I suggest is just to start with right now, I I feel, I'm thinking, I'm wondering. So just a simple prompt like that to just put down whatever's whatever's on your mind. I mean, some people need journal prompts. And there are journal prompts online. All you have to do is is just type in journal prompts, you know, um, Google journal prompts, and you you will get them. But the most important thing is to be to know that the journal is for you. And I think that for me, my biggest problem was that I was writing for myself. That was not the problem. The problem was that initially I thought that my journal should go to my children, and then I realized that in fact they should not have these journals, that, that there's so much that I wrote for my eyes only. And also if people confided in me and or told me something that I really needed to process, it was not for my children to have that information. And so I basically went back and um, started reading my journals from 1974. It took me 14 years to read them, take excerpts out, and then put them into a book of those excerpts that I felt safe and comfortable sharing, some of which were are, are really, um, I felt very vulnerable. I still do, but I'm still doing it because I'm writing, actually writing the second volume now and just know that it's important to, to share the life lessons. I mean, basically that's what it's at. But, but for me, I think that journaling, if, if you ever, if one ever gets stuck and you just don't know what now, I, and, and then just let the pen flow and don't worry about grammar and don't worry about what you've written and don't read it over and edit it just right. I never edit what I write in my journals. I just, they, there are just no cross outs. I just keep going. And I think that that's probably the best thing to do. And the other thing is to just do it. People, people generally write when they're having problems. The, the greater majority of people who journal write the difficult times and not, not, the happy times. I say write it all. Um, I have had so many people say, I start a journal, I don't finish it, I start another one, I have 20 unfinished journals. And that's fine too, just as long as you write. Because really, writing and getting it down on paper makes such a difference. It's freeing. It's almost like when you clean out a closet. You know, when you clean out a closet or organize your kitchen, there's a freedom. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the same with journaling. It just kind of clears the clutter out of your head and, and allows you to um, be, feel freer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. So are there any specific, I mean, I love the prompts, but do you have specific prompts that, or I should say go-tos that you use or that you see other people find a bigger connection with? I don't. Um, I have 
hundreds of prompts. I have been doing a journaling circle with 15 women since April of 2020, every Sunday morning. And each week I give them six different journal prompts. And basically there, it's just about mostly what you're thinking, feeling, what life is like, what are you struggling with? What are your hopes and dreams? Those kinds of things. Um, I would be happy to, to send you a list of prompts that you could put, you know, in the show notes, if you'd like some general prompts that would be uh, that people might want to start with, if you'd like me to do that. Sure. That'd be great. Or are they on your website? Do you share them on your website? Well, I do have, I do have um, some on my website. If you go to my website, you can definitely get them. Um, You just have to put in your email address and then you can get them. Yeah. Yeah, I'll put the link to your okay. website in the show oh, notes so people can okay. go and access those because I think good. it's I can put them in the website, but I think it'll be really nice for people to actually go and and connect with you through your sure. website as well because I think you have a lot to offer and for anyone who is and and you know I mean for me I'm I'm in that middle place right my I mean my father's deceased but my mother is still living and then I have my children and right. you know for those of us that are in that middle place I think it's really important to start thinking about like maybe maybe you want to start asking those questions or maybe you want to encourage your your older relatives to start writing things down. I know I have, um, like my grandmother had this these little calendars she would keep and her notes are in there. And it's just so fun to go back and and read what, what her thoughts were or what she was thinking or what she was doing. Or One of the questions that I ask in my class is, what are the questions that you wish you had asked your grandparents or your parents and then answer those questions for yourself and give those questions to your family. So I think yeah. that that's the kind of thing, you know, it's never too late to do that for yourself so that they have them. But there are so many people who regret having not had the conversations. Mm-hmm. And yeah. so it's today's, today's the only day we have, you know, right this moment, we have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow. So I say, do it now. Yeah, that's beautiful advice. Meryl, where can the listeners connect with you, learn more from you? My website is Merle R. Saferstein. It's M-E-R-L-E-R-S-A-F-E-R-S-T-E-I-N.com. And uh, you can certainly connect if anyone wants help or advice. I'm happy to help do whatever. That's offer you awesome. Anything. Well, thank you so much for sharing yourself and your, your, your journey and all of these tips and tools with us. This has just been a beautiful conversation. I could talk to you for hours on end, um, but we'll have to save that for another time. Maybe we can have tea in, in Florida. (laughs) That would be nice. That would be really nice. Thank you, Robin. It's been wonderful talking to you. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Listeners, I encourage you to hop over to Meryl's website, go to the show notes. I will have that link there, but I encourage you to go and download those journaling prompts because I can tell you how freeing it is. And, you know, when I think about having written my book and and how that's such a significant part of my journey and it, telling my story and telling, sharing the things that are important to me and how other people can use my experiences, but also take all of these lessons that I've learned and the things that I wish I'd known when all of those things are things that I want to leave, you know, my legacy, my experiences with other people to help them. And I think when we start to look at creating that ripple effect of good in the world, doing this and creating our legacy is one of the ways we can do that. So I encourage everybody to go start journaling, get all that stuff out of your head and put it on paper because I, you won't regret it. I promise you. And it is as simple as starting with those little questions. Like today I feel, or I'm thinking, and then if it is negative, you can even journal the opposite of that, the positive, and you'll start to transition your thoughts from a negative place to a positive place. And that is so empowering for just your journey, whether it's as an entrepreneur or life, raising children, whatever it may be. So I encourage you to do that. And if you know anyone else who would benefit from this information, please share the episode, share it on social media, share it with your friends, your email list, whoever, but encourage people to really touch base with who they are and what they want to leave the world and their relatives and their loved ones. All right. With that, you guys, I'm going to close out, but we will see you here again next week.